Nowhere in the Bible does it say you must believe that Jesus Christ is Yahweh, is God himself, God Almighty himself, says that you must confess that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. That was Young Don. For those of you who do not know, Young Don is a content creator with a big channel here on YouTube. Um, he has 360,000 subscribers. He gets over a thousand people to watch while he's live streaming. He's a streamer. Uh, and so he has a pretty big channel. Um, why he's relevant right now in this conversation to this video is he announced about uh, almost a year ago, about 10 months ago, not even a full year, that he has come to Christianity um, and the reasons why he came to Christianity and he announced the Lord as a savior and claimed to be a Christian. Now, this is why this is troubling, because just yesterday from the day of this stream, he went live on YouTube with almost a thousand people watching and denounced the Trinity. The, tr the fact of the matter is, I still believe that Jesus came from the Father and not in some metaphorical, weird, mysterious way to where he uh, in some way always existed alongside the Father while still coming from the Father, being born of the Father. Eternally begotten is how the Catholics would put it. I was like, yeah, this does, this is just not adding up to me. It's just not making sense. Him being a new Christian, as you guys see from this, this was a part of this stream. If you guys want to check out his full stream, three hours, go check it out. Now, I want to start by saying this. This is not a bashing video. This is not a video to attack Young Don. This is not a video to discourage him, to put him down in any way, shape, and form. In fact, I would love to have a conversation with you, Young Don. I hope and pray that this video reaches you and so that we can con connect with each other and hopefully discuss the scriptures. Because I really believe that if we have a conversation, I'll be able to hopefully, by God's will, bring some light to these verses that you're bringing up, okay? Um, but with that said, uh, there's something that I want to touch on here, and that is the importance of doctrine and sound doctrine, the importance of community. Young Don is a lone wolf out there. He's a new Christian or, you know, claiming to be a new Christian um, and who is out already doing videos and live streams and addressing deep topics on salvation and the doctrine of God and things of this nature instead of taking the time to sit and learn these subjects, go and develop yourself in the knowledge of these subjects and ask these questions with people who know better, with, uh, with, with, with pastors and bishops and uh, overseers. Instead, you're doing this on your own, which is not wise at all. Matter of fact, Proverbs talks about how uh, the wise man seeks counsel and surrounds himself with counsel, but right now you're doing it on your own and it's not good because now you're out here and you are susceptible to false teaching and heresy. The Bible has these things that it pays close attention to that it repeats over and over again. Like for example, sexual immorality. It warns repeatedly all over the Bible, over and over again, against the dangers of sexual immorality, fleeing from it, avoid it with all costs, die to your flesh when it comes to sexual immorality, just, just run from it with, with all your might if you can, run from sexual immorality, kill it in your body, in your flesh, right? That's what the Bible repeatedly warns us about. But there's also something else that it repeatedly warns us about, and that is false doctrine and false teaching, strange teaching, strange doctrine, and a false gospel. It repeatedly warns the believers against false doctrine and false preachers who will come up and start teaching strange doctrine, especially to new believers. In fact, we go to Galatians chapter one, watch what Paul says to the people in Galatia. He starts off by saying in verse six, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So Paul is sitting here, he's surprised, he's flabbergasted. I was just with you guys. I go away and you guys are so quickly deserting the gospel that you received from these false teachers. He continues, 
But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. This is all throughout the scriptures. And in fact, if we go to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, he also warns against false teachers and false doctrine. Watch this. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who, brought, who bought them, bringing upon themselves a swift destruction. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. You guys catching it? It's a pattern here. It's a continuous warning against false teachings and false doctrine because that's dangerous. It repeats this. Romans chapter 16, verses 17 to 18. It says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. It is so important that you guys, as Christians, as believers, me, myself, I'm included, especially when we're new to this, when we're new to the walk, that we surround ourselves with believers who are sound in the faith, who rightly divide the word of truth, and who grow us in development in our spiritual walk. We cannot be alone out here because we happen to be part of the naive group, the group that's susceptible to false doctrine. This is actually, in fact, the reason why God has, has given us pastors and preachers and teachers, prophets and apostles. In fact, Ephesians 4, it breaks this down. Starting at verse 11, it says this, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building the body of Christ, until we all attain the, to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. And you'll notice if you go check out his, his, uh, his stream, he talks about how he's going uh, from one idea to the next, from one doctrine to the other. Is Jesus uncreated? Is he not? Is he eternal? And things of this nature being swayed and moved by every wave of doctrine. The Bible warns against this and actually has provided ways that we can avoid this danger. And so I continue to study. And, you know, there was a point in time where I was like, oh, maybe Jesus didn't pre-exist the world, right? Maybe he was an eternal. By surrounding us with sound people, with sound doctrine, and spending time with the Lord, instead of going out there on our own. Even Paul himself, Paul went to Peter, James and John to affirm the revelation that he received to make sure that he wasn't preaching and running in vain. So we all need that confirmation. We all need to be led by the spirit and be surrounded by the church. With that being said, you guys want to see the Bible interpret the Bible? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you must believe that Jesus Christ is Yahweh, is God himself. Does the Bible teach that you must believe that he is God Almighty, Yahweh in the flesh in order to be saved? Well, Jesus answers this question in John chapter 8, verse 24. He says, I told you that you will die in your sins. Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now, why is this significant? Jesus claiming the phrase of himself, I am he. Why would this matter to the Jews? Because claiming to be God, that means nothing. Just saying I am God, that means anybody was doing it, everybody and their mama was doing that. But claiming to be Yahweh, now that holds weight to the Jews. And so Jesus shows you that there's levels to this. When we go to the Hebrew scriptures in Isaiah chapter 41, verse four, it reads, I, the Lord, the first and the last, 
I am he. Isaiah 43.10, that you may know and believe that I am he. 46.4, even to your old age, I am he. Isaiah 48.12, listen to me, Jacob, Israel, whom I have called, I am he, the first and the last. So when Jesus says that I am he, and you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am he. He's claiming to be Yahweh of the Old Testament who says the exact same thing to the Israelites. That I am doing this so that you may know and believe that I am he. And if you don't, you will die in your sins. Does that make sense? So yes, according to the scriptures, according to Jesus, unless you believe that he is Yahweh, God in the flesh, God Almighty, the true God, then you will die in your sins. You have a false gospel and you have a false Christ, a creature who cannot save you. But if you do not have the right teaching, then you'll end up saying stuff like this. He calls him his father. To be someone's father, it means you must exist before your son. It's that simple. It is that simple. In order to be the father, actually, it's not that you exist before your son, but that you beget a son. You're not a father unless you have a son. My father has been a father for only 28 years. Even though he's lived longer than 28 years, he's been a, he became a father when I was born. But God has always been the father. He's always been the heavenly father. So if he's always been the father, then he's always had the son. There is not a point in time where God the father became the father. He's always been the father which means that there's not a point in time where he didn't have a son. Christ has always been there from the beginning as the son with the father. It's that simple, which would also lead us into the next objection. Look at this. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now think about that. He's the firstborn of every creature. What does this mean? For him to be the firstborn of a set, it means he needs to be a part of that set. Guys, if you guys want to check out a video where I debunk this argument with Jehovah's Witnesses live in their face, um, you can check out this video right here, go to it. We literally address this subject here. Now, I want you guys to notice something. Notice how, and guys, go check out his stream. You guys can go see it. It's three hours long. Go see it. You can see the context. He never quoted the next verse. He never quoted the next verse that tells him why Paul is calling Jesus the firstborn of all creation. And I have, uh, I have my reasons why I think that is. I think it's because he doesn't know to do that. I don't think he knows to read in context or how to read the Bible in its context. I don't think he knows how to do that. He's fresh, he's new to this. This is not a bashing, this is just my observation. And so this is why it's important, it is so important for you to just sit and humble yourself, man. You gotta humble yourself before you're going up live and, and rushing to spread your ideas and these false doctrines because now you are, you, you, can, you can be humiliated, even though that's not the purpose of these things, but you can come out and you, 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 it does, it's not a good look. It's not a good look. If we read the next verse of Colossians, it tells us why Jesus is called the firstborn of all creation. Number one, here's a fun fact. Firstborn doesn't always mean literally firstborn. Firstborn can mean, literally mean the firstborn, the first thing, the oldest thing, or it can be a position of preeminence, a position of supremacy. And so the context tells you what firstborn means, right? So check this out, Colossians chapter one. After we have read in verse 15 that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, it then goes on and says this in verse 16. For by him all things were created in heaven on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. So in what way is Jesus the firstborn of all creation? He's preeminent over all creation. Notice how he's not a part of that set, young Don, because it's by him 
that all things were created. That excludes himself. He himself was not created. He's the one who created all things and is before all things. In him, all things hold together, right? So this isn't saying that he's part of creation. It's saying he's above it. And John chapter one helps this point. You mentioned this in your, in your stream. Well, you didn't go over it, but you briefly mentioned it. Watch this. John chapter one, verse one to three. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. Do you guys see that? That without him, nothing came into existence. All things that came into existence came into existence through Jesus. That means Jesus had to already exist. That means Jesus never came into existence. He's not part of that. But that's how you rightly divide the scripture. The scripture is emphatically clear that Jesus is eternal. He's infinite, never had a beginning, never has an end, and has always existed alongside the Father, creating the world, sustaining the world, and holding it up by the word of his power. Watch this, what we get in Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications of, for sins, he has sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Very clear. Not only has the son always been there, but the son is the one by whom he sustains the universe. All of creation, all of existence is sustained by the word of the son. And he is the radiance of the glory of God. Is God's glory finite? No. God's glory is infinite, and Jesus is the radiance of that infinite glory and the exact imprint of his nature. So how can you make the conclusion that Jesus is a creature? No creature is the imprint of the nature of God, having the nature of God. I was like, yeah, this does, this is just not adding up to me. It's just not making sense. So you see how he sits at the right hand of majesty, ruling with God the Father, which brings us to our next objection here. Who does Jesus pray to? He tells us who to pray to. Therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come. It is the Father's kingdom. Your will be done. Jesus says, for the Gentile world eagerly seeks all these things, and your Father knows that you need them, but seek his kingdom. Now, whose kingdom is it? Again, this is what happens when you do not know how to rightly divide the scriptures. If you guys notice, see, he's asking, see, whose kingdom is it? It's God the Father's kingdom. But wasn't it him who earlier read that it was actually also the kingdom of his son? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let the footage be. Let the receipts talk. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, whose kingdom is it? into the kingdom of his dear son. The gospel of the kingdom of God. It's God's kingdom. Jesus does not call it our kingdom. Into the kingdom of his dear son. Also, when we go and look at John chapter 18, when Jesus is being questioned by Pilate, he says that my kingdom is not of this world. Whose kingdom is it? My kingdom is not of this world. So where? Young Don is Jesus's kingdom. Maybe in heaven, maybe the kingdom of heaven is his kingdom along with the father's kingdom. The father's kingdom is the son's kingdom. It's not either or, it's both and. But you guys, you would know this if you knew how to rightly divide the scriptures. And then you ask, who does Jesus pray to? Of course, he's communicating with the father. Prayer is just communication. Jesus was with the Father from eternity's past, communicating, fellowshipping with the Father and the Spirit, always from eternity. So why would it change when he now comes down to earth? Is he going to stop talking to the Father, stop communicating with him now, now that he's human? No. He doesn't become an atheist. He's going to continue that communication and prayer. But th that's not all, though. Jesus also tells us that we can pray to him. 
In John chapter 14, verses 12 to 14, Jesus says when he's going to the Father that we can ask anything in his name and he'll do it. He says, ask me anything in my name and I will do it. So Jesus says that we can also pray to him. We can address him. Now think about this, young Don, and everyone listening. For Jesus to be able to hear all the prayers of the saints all over the place, all over the world, what kind of attribute would he have to have in order to be able to hear and know who's praying and know what we're praying for? What kind of attribute would he have to have? He would have to be all-knowing. He would also have to be omnipresent to be able to answer every request wherever we are, millions and billions of us on the planet, at the same time omnipresent, all-knowing, omnipresent, and then what type of attribute would Jesus have to have in order to be able to answer any request of us? Ask me anything in my name and I will do it. For him to be able to do anything we ask, what attribute does he have to have? Omnipotence, all-powerful. So with these verses alone, we see that Jesus is all-knowing, omnipresent, not limited to space and time, and he's all powerful, able to answer and grant our requests, whatever it is, wherever we are, at whatever time, it doesn't matter. These are the attributes of God, and this is the God that you're denying. You never knew him, and before you got to know him, you left him, and now you're rejecting him. You're rejecting the master who bought you. So I'm saying this with love, I'm saying this to encourage you, bro. Dive deep into your word, dive deep into your scriptures and humble yourself. If you're bold enough to be able to come on a live stream and talk about these type of things, these views, your views, these beliefs, then you should be able to give an answer and a reason for why you believe. And that's biblical. Oh my God. Logic.